Um, so my course is going to be co-taught with Anthony, so you'll see a second lecture tomorrow. The goal of today's first lecture is just to give kind of a broad introduction to a family of groups called diagram groups, which lend themselves particularly well to algorithmic problems. Um, and the second lecture, then you'll see some more aspects of the geometry of these groups. So uh, let's start with a little history and some practice with these boards. Let's see. All right, so the names you see most often affiliated with diagram groups are that of Guba and Sapir. Uh, but really, the introduction of these go back, uh, so first, to Meekin and Sapir. Um, so they introduced these groups, but the first real extensive study of them um, appears in a thesis uh, by Kilabarta. But now, you know, um, over the years, Guba and Sapir did an, an extensive amount of work really developing out the theory. So yeah, so much of the historical work goes back to Guba and Sapir, um, including uh, memoirs of the AMS, which I believe we have available in the library written by Guba and Sapir on this topic. Uh, so the, yeah, there's a lot of reasons to study these diagram groups. Um, the first is they contain lots of examples of groups we generally care about. So examples um, included in diagram groups. So the first and probably the motivating reason why they were defining these groups is um, it contains Thompson's group F, um, which we'll define at some point during today's lecture. Um, but in addition to Thompson's group F, it contains things like uh, infinite lamplighter groups, so Z reef Z is what I mean by that. Um, it also includes many art and group, many right angled art and groups. Although not all. Um, and it contains things like free groups and free abelian groups. Um, and many others. Um, yeah, so one of the benefits of diagram groups is they have multiple perspectives that you can approach them with. Um, one, which is diagrammatic. So, um, yeah, so perspectives. So we'll discuss two, pers two of these perspectives in today's lecture. So the first is we can view them as diagrams over semi-group presentations. OK, again, this needs defined. We haven't defined what that means to say a diagram over a semi-group presentation. But the point is, you can think about elements as pictures. And a second perspective, um, coming more from geometry or algebraic topology, um, is as fundamental groups. Fundamental groups. of something called squire complexes. All right, and the second approach, so the first is the one that gives us all of these algorithmic properties. The second is the one that's going to then give us some of the more geometric properties. Um, right, so as I mentioned, these groups, in addition to including lots of groups that we care about, they have a lot of nice algorithmic properties. Um, and these perspectives let you prove these things. So properties. Um, so we'll start with algorithmic properties that you can prove about these groups. Um, some of these will appear in the exercise session tomorrow. So um, in terms of algorithmic properties, um, these groups have solvable word problems. Okay. 
right? And so what this means is given a word in the generating set, can we tell if it gives the trivial element? Um, these groups also, in addition, so the answer for these groups is yes. If you give some element in the group, you can check whether it's the trivial element or not. Um, <coughs> they also have solvable conjugacy problem. All right, so this is like the word problem, except you want to know whether two elements in the group are conjugate. So given G and H and G, does there exist um, some other element, f, such that g is equal to f inverse h, f? All right, again, this is something that you can answer uh, for diagram groups, right? If, you give, if, I'm, if I give you two elements, you can figure out whether or not the two elements are conjugate in the group. Um, right. Okay, uh, you can also, so these groups have some additional properties, so two, um, orderability. Uh, so these groups are all what's called orderable, um, and so what that means, so we say a group G is orderable, um, if you can put some total order, or if you can put some order on the group, right, if you can put some order on the group that behaves well with respect to multiplication. So more precisely, a group is orderable um, if there exists an order on the group G um, such that we can say that G is less than, less than H if and only if for every other element f and g, we have that g, um, we have that f g is less than f times h. So you have some order that um, behaves well. And since I'm doing left multiplication here, we usually write that it is left orderable here. Um, you can define the same thing for right orderability if you do multiplication on the right. All right, geometric properties. All right, um, so there are some geometric properties that you can study about these. And for these, since Anthony will spend more time on them tomorrow, uh, I will just name them and not go into detail. Yes? Total order. Uh, yeah, so total order. Yeah, total order here. Yeah. yeah, every two elements are comparable. Um, but the geometric properties that you'll see some things about tomorrow include median-like properties, um, so these you can think about as being aspects of non-positive curvature. And sometimes these groups also have negative curvature-like properties, um, so things like acylindrically hyperbolic, hyperbolicity, which you can think about as being some aspect of negative curvature. Um, which again, you'll see much more about tomorrow. All right. So let's start defining some of the things we need. Um, so to do this, I, so all of these things, these diagram groups, they depend on having a semi-group presentation. So we're going to start with a crash course on semi-groups. So 
what's the finest in my group? Um, since we're at a group theory conference, we'll give actually the definition. Well, we're not at a group theory conference, but we're in a group theory month. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's define a semigroup. So a semigroup um, is just a set S together uh, with an associative multiplication. So semi-groups are a lot like groups, right? We have this multiplication, but we're missing some things. So um, the things we're missing from a semi-group that make it possibly not a group is um, so, so we're not guaranteed an identity element. Identity element. Um, and we're not guaranteed inverses. All right, so these are just plate and you know sets where we have um, some form of multiplication. All right, uh, examples. All right, um, well we know groups are non-empty because you're always assumed to have an identity element, but we don't have that hypothesis here. So indeed, there exists an empty semigroup. Um, similarly, you can define a one element semigroup. Uh, so, this is just the semigroup with an element A such that A squared equals A. Um, but unlike groups, so how many groups of order two do we have? <laughs> just one, right? Um, so, semigroups are much broader than groups. Um, there are, in fact, five semigroups of order two. Um, but some other examples that we can think about to have in the back of our mind um, is to think about, for instance, um, the set of positive integers under addition. Right? Since we're only considering positive integers, we don't have inverses necessarily. Um, and maybe the example that comes up most often, most naturally, right? we often think about groups as being symmetries, and then we're thinking about them as bijective functions. So of course, you can think about functions that are not bijective, and so when you drop bijective, this is when you get things like semigroups. So for instance, we can think about um, the set of functions from a set to itself under composition. Okay. Question. That runs okay. All right. Um, right, so now uh, we, need what, we need to understand what presentations are for our semigroups. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah. So semigroups have presentations just like groups do, right? Um, it's just you don't have all types of relations showing up.
All right, uh, semi-group presentations. All right, um, and in an analogous way to how you define group presentations, you can consider semi-group presentations in terms of generators and relators. Generators and relations. All right, so in other words, we can think about our semi-group as defined you know, by some set and some set of relations. But our relations now, what they have to look like, so R is going to be a collection of the form U1 equals V1, U2 equals V2, et cetera, et cetera, where UI and VI are non-empty words. in the generating set sigma. All right, because we don't have the existence of identities necessarily, this is why we have to assume that these are non-empty here. Um, and what this means when we write this presentation, um, so meaning, so just like in groups, we start by taking uh, the sigma plus, which is going to be the free semi-group on the set sigma. And then we declare elements to be equivalent. We'll say x, some word x is equivalent to y, if and only if we can apply some series of relations to get from x to y. So if and only if, well, OK, so we'll say x is equivalent to y. Um, so I'll do equivalent, use, do this double equivalence with a subscript e here, uh, if and only if. So first we say x equals sut and y equals svt, um, where u equals v is a relation, or v equals u is some relation in R. And then we take the closure of this equivalence relation. Um, so then, then taking the reflexive and transitive closure. All right, so in other words, we're declaring two words to be equivalent if you can perform some series of replacements using uh, the relations R to get from one to the other. All right, um, what this does is this gives you a quotient. Once you have this equivalence relation, this gives a quotient of this free semi-group, um, and we declare this to be X. gives our semi-group. All right, so in practice, what does this really mean for us in practice? It means that, for instance, if I take S to be given, S to be given by this presentation, A, B, C, D, and I declare, say, A squared equals B, C, Then this implies that if I look at the words, say, D, B, A, A, D, that I can replace this double instance of A with B, C here and get D, B, B, C, D. Right, I'm allowed to do these types of substitutions. But on the other hand, but if, say, I know D, B, A is equal to B, C, A, this does not necessarily mean that I can, you know, I can just cancel the A's from the right side. So this does not mean necessarily that D, B equals B, C. So this is where these presentations differ from groups, right? In groups, you can do cancellations. In semi-groups, you're not guaranteed cancellations. Yeah? What's your reason? Uh, you do the three bars for B? Uh, just, uh, I just use a subscript E, but I can drop that. I'm just <coughs> declaring them to be So I declare two elements to be equivalent. So what I'm saying is I put, you know, I say x is equal to y here if it's this, and then I extend this to an equivalence relation. Just e is just a letter, yeah, just e for equivalent. Okay. <laughs> yeah, e is just a letter, yeah. It doesn't mean anything here. All right, but the point is here with semi-groups, you can replace subwords. You can't do things like cancellation necessarily. Right? These things are not guaranteed to you. 
Okay, that's our crash course on semi-groups. So now let's get to uh, diagram groups. Oh, okay. It's faster, but it's not as nice, right? Yeah, I mean, you're So uh, diagram groups, yeah? Diagram groups. All right, so um, as I said, these diagram groups, they depend on a presentation. So let's let P sigma R be a, pre be a semi-group presentation. And now, given two positive words, so given two positive words, say U and V, and I'm saying the word positive here because, as we said, unlike groups, we don't have inverses. So when I talk about positive words, it just means I'm not using any negative exponents showing up here. Um, but if these two elements, U and V, um, equal in the semi-group, so if they're equal in the semi-group, um, what this means is there exists a derivation say <coughs> u goes to w1, goes to w2, dot dot dot, goes to wn, which goes to, let's say, so let's let u be the first one, u equals w1, and wn will be our final step of v. And what this derivation means, so where uh, for each i, what we have here um, is that each step here just corresponds to doing a single replacement using the relation set. So where for each i, more precisely, what we'll have is wi will equal, say, um, x i, v i, y i, and w i plus one will equal x i, um, u i, y i, where u i equals v i is one of our relations, or the other direction, v i equals u i is one of our relations. So all we're saying is that each step, we're doing a single substitution using the relation set. OK. Um, so for example, for example, again, we can take our presentation. So P, say AB, where we'll have two relations, AB equals BA. And a equals a squared. Then we can take a derivation, a, b, b, a. And I can replace a, b here um, with b, a. So this gives me b, a, b, a. And then I can do another relation. So let's replace this one with a, b. So this gives me b, a, a, b. And I can keep going. So now I have this double A in the middle, which I can replace with a single A, which gives me BAB. And um, let's do one more. So let's take this BA and replace it with AB, 
and this gives me a v b. So this is like a derivation in the semi-group for this presentation. All right, and as it turns out, so such a derivation can be represented by a diagram. All right, so this is sort of a definition by example. So the way we make these diagrams, so I start with a line segment with my original word here. So I'm going to have a, a four edge graph. So A, B, B, A. And now I want to do my first derivation, my first substitution. So my first substitution was I took A, B, and I replaced it with B, A. So I draw an edge here where I replace A, B with B, A. And then I keep going. So my next step was to replace this BA with an AB. So I draw another substitution here, BA. Then I took my double A's in the middle, and I replaced them. Uh, this should be AB. Then I took my double A's in the middle and replaced them with a single A. So I draw my next edge here, which is a single A for the next step in the derivation. And then the final step was I took the initial BA and I replaced it with an AB. And so then I have AB. And this is my diagram for this derivation. All right, we can formalize this, yes. So let's give a formal definition to what's going on here. Great definition. A diagram over a semi group presentation Sigma R is a planar oriented. Uh, graph, which I'll call a delta, um, whose oriented edges are labeled by elements in the generating set, by elements in sigma, such that One, the first thing is we want delta to have a unique source and a unique sink. So delta has a unique source, all right, meaning uh, the leftmost vertex in these pictures. And we're thinking about this orientation. So I didn't draw an orientation on my graph, but you can think about this as being oriented left to right here in these pictures. So delta has a unique source. Um, and a unique sink, here being the rightmost vertex. Again, if you're thinking about this oriented left to right, you can see that once I get to this you know, rightmost vertex, I can't go any further, right? This is all this is saying. Um, and the notation we'll use for this, so I'll write uh, the source as iota of delta and the sink as tau of delta, so the initial and terminal vert vertices. Um, two, the second condition is I have all of these sort of embedded cells here, all these. Um, so the boundary 
of every cell pi uh, is a disjoint union. of oriented paths of oriented paths which we'll refer to as the top and bottom paths top so I'll use the notation top of pi uh, and bottom of pi And three, for every cell with top label, so say top of pi, um, the label with the label of top pi given by some word u and bot pi given with some word w. W, um, then U equals W should be one of our relations. So U equals W is an R, um, or W equals U is an R. OK, I hear some, are there questions? <laughs> I hear some discussion, so I just want to make sure if anyone has a question they want to ask. Yeah. Graphs are finite. These will be finite graphs. Yeah, finite graphs. Yeah. Definitely my group presentation is a planar oriented. Yeah, I'm going to have the word finite here. Finite graphs. Any other questions? The, the boundary of the entire graph uh, should be also made of two parts, it's a consequence of, of one. Yes, exactly. So the top and bottom. Well, um, what you can see is that each step, right, since we have that the individual cells correspond to doing a single derivation step, what that means is the top and bottom will be equal elements in the semigroup. This is all we know about it. No, but why, why just the boundary will have two paths? You require it for every cell. For every but cell. It's does it imply that for the entire graph it will be? Uh, also two paths. It will also be two paths, but it won't but be why? true. But why? Uh, that we have these. Um, we have this for every cell, but why do we have for, for, for the entire thing? That the top and bottom will be paths? Yeah. Uh, because we have a unique source and a unique sink. We have a unique leftmost and a unique rightmost vertex. And what, what do you call source and sink? Yeah, and my picture here. So let's look at these different pieces. So all we're saying, right? So I'm going to think about this as being my source. This is my sink, and what I'm doing to build these is that, and this is one of my cells pi. No, no, this picture is clear, but yes. you should just define in general as a graph with some properties. Yes, yes. The source is what? Yeah, so it's an oriented graph, so I'm yeah. thinking about this as oriented. So source means it has a unique vertex that has only outgoing edges. Yeah. Yeah, so I can think about all these edges being outgoing here. So I have a unique leftmost vertex where all the edges going out of it are going so to the how right. How do you derive that there is only, only uh, uh, the, the, the boundary of the entire thing is just two parts? Yeah, I mean. It's kind of obvious, but why? <laughs> I guess I didn't understand. Yeah, well, so the point is it's made of these cells that have tops and bottoms, and the way they're. Um, for cells, it's clear. For cells, it's clear. So for the entire graph then. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, it's just, yeah, maybe I should add some words here about how the cells are attached that, um, you know, maybe if you add some words about attaching, maybe that will clarify. So we things. can think about a diagram as something inductively constructed. Sure, like this. yes, if you would that like. Is, yes, yes. If you want, you can reword this definition in terms of an inductive process, and that will exactly give you this as well. Yes. Yeah, I'll bring it back up. <laughs> I just brought this down so I could write on it, but let's bring it back up. So, so, but it's exactly this. So I'm just trying to formalize this example, right? Which is I start with, you know, I have some derivation, some finite derivation from one word to the x, to one word to the next, and at each process I'm going to inductively add in a cell um, where the top of the cell corresponds to 
um, the, t the one side of the relation and the bottom corresponds to the other side of the relation. So think about the example if you don't like the definition. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, a consequence of this is that um, we can also talk about the top and bottom of the entire thing, right, as this was mentioned. Right, so all I've talked about here is labeling the top and bottom of individual cells in the diagram. But you can also talk about the top of delta and the bottom of delta. And so because these are finite derivations, these are finite graphs, um, if I consider top of delta, it's label. So if I look at the label of the top of delta and the label of bottom of delta, bot delta, um, these are equal words in the semigroup. So these words, say, are equal as elements in the semigroup. In the semigroup for the presentation. Okay, so this is the point. And any two elements that are equal, if you give me a derivation, we can build up um, such a diagram. All right, um, so we have a way of multiplying diagrams, but the diagram multiplication only works sometimes. So it, let's say we have two diagrams. So if delta and delta prime are two diagrams, um, such that the label of bot delta and the label of top delta prime are the same. Then we can have a multiplication, and the multiplication is just to stack your diagrams. So then we have a concatenation by stacking. All right, and so this tells us now that we have this multiplication. Um, yeah, so we can do maybe an example here. Again, our goal here eventually, right, is to get a group out of this. So at some point, we need to adjust things so that we can always multiply things. So this is sort of what we're leading up to next. Example, again, we're going to take our presentation, P equals A, B, um, with the same relations we had before, A, B equals B, A, A squared equals A. Um, then, let's say I have a diagram, A, B, A, and I do some derivations to it, so I do B, A, A. And then I take some other diagram here, such that the top is labeled by B and A. So I take B, A here. And then I do some derivations to it. So say A, B. And then maybe I plug in an A squared here. Then I can stack these, because my bottom of this diagram is labeled by B, A, the top here is also labeled by B, A. Then I can take the concatenation. And so what that's going to look like here is I'm going to have A, B, A, B, A, A, and now I start adding these pieces to it. So I have 
Um, then my first step is to replace BA with AB. So I get AB. And then I replace this A with an A squared. So this is the concatenation of these two diagrams. All right, so in order for us to be able to always have some multiplication, what we need to do is we need to guarantee that our elements have the same top and bottom for any diagram I'm looking at. And so what I'm going to do then is then if we, we can fix some u uh, in this generating set, some word, and then we can consider only diagrams, only diagrams with the label of the top being u and the label of the bottom. All right, and if I restrict to this collection of diagrams, then I always have a way to multiply things, yeah? And so um, if I make this restriction, um, then what we have now is we now have an associative multiplication that works on ele all elements, and so what we have is a semigroup. All right, so we're getting closer and closer to a group, right? We're still trying to get to a group right now. We don't have inverses. This is the current problem, right? Um, and we don't have, well, um, we do have an identity element. Does anyone know what the identity element would be here? Yeah, it's just going to be, it's just going to be the, you know, a single uh, line graph, right? It's going to be a line with just the label U. Yeah, so we have an identity element. So the only thing we're missing now to get into a group is to have some form of inverses. So to do this, we need, um, yeah. Yeah, it just means you're doing a longer derivation, yeah? So if you concatenate them, right, then you're still going to have a derivation that takes you from the top word to the bottom word, um, and you're just going to follow the derivations in this bigger diagram. So it just, it just corresponds to a longer derivation in the relation. So more substitutions. <laughs> yeah. Does that mean? Yeah. It is the same as the concatenation of the individual diagram. Yes, exactly. That's right. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, U, so if they're both U, so if they have, so this is just the letter U. So I'm fixing some, some word in the generating set, and I want the label to always, at the top, and the label at the bottom of the whole diagram to always be U. Okay. So the cells can have lots of different labels, but I want the whole top of the diagram and the whole bottom of the diagram to be U. All right, so, um, yeah. And in all this, the generators and relations are fixed. We yeah, we're fixing a presentation. So all of this depends on a presentation for a semigroup, yes. And indeed, it depends not on the semigroup itself, but on the presentation. So uh, if you choose different presentations for the same semigroup, you will get different results out of this. So it depends, in fact, on a presentation, yeah. I'm maybe getting ahead of things, but maybe you can reverse the diagram. Yes, but how do we cancel, right? Indeed, that will be the inverse, yeah. Um, so as we're seeing, as one might guess, right, the inverse is going to be to take the reflection of the diagram, because that will also be a diagram with top label and bottom label the same. But we don't know yet how to cancel. So let's talk about cancellation. Um, so let me name these types of diagrams. So we call these UU spherical diagrams. So we're looking at now a semi-group consisting of the UU uh, spherical diagrams. All right, so to have some cancellation, then we need the notion of a dipole. So a dipole, then, is just going to consist of a diagram with just two cells. So a, di yeah, um, a dipole is a diagram with two cells, say pi and pi prime such that um, pi prime is the reflection of pi, so such that pi prime is the reflection of pi prime, and such that they're identified on their top and bottom, right? And such that So 
Sorry, what's the question? Ah, pi. Pi prime is a reflection of pi. Um, we'll do a picture here, yeah? Um, and such that the top of pi prime should be exactly identified with the bottom of pi. So example, um, if we use the same presentation, I can look at a diagram that starts as AB, becomes BA, and then goes back to AB. Okay, so this is a dipole, yeah? So here's my pi, and here's my pi prime. So I have these two cells, they're stacked exactly, um, and the top one is a reflection of the bottom one, or vice versa, however you want to say that. All right, and so then, for us to start doing things like cancellation, what we're going to say is whenever we have dipoles, we can remove them, right? This is what's going to let us build these inverses. So now what we're going to do is we're going to allow, we're, um, so what we're going to do is whenever we have a dipole, a dipole, we can remove it. And so the idea now is our next step is to declare um, diagrams to be equivalent if they're the same up to adding and removing dipoles. And that's what will let us have a group structure. So in combinatorial terms, a yeah. diagram is just a sequence of, of, of replacement, uh -huh. and dipole is the sequence of two inverse replacements. Yes, exactly, yes, yes, down. yes, yeah. But there's a little bit of a subtlety there, which we'll see in a moment when we talk about um, these squire complexes, which is that you can have um, two different derivations that give you the same diagram. So that's the only subtlety with what you've said, is that if you do things on disjoint words, like if you do, then you'll end up, so, so it is slightly different than saying, so, so every um, derivation gives you a diagram uh, every diagram does not give you a unique derivation. You have to be a little careful. But again, we'll make that precise in a moment. So right, so now we'll say two diagrams are equivalent okay. two diagrams are equivalent are equivalent if they differ by a series of dipole insertions and reductions. All right. And so now, once you have this equivalence relation, now this reflection that was mentioned, right, taking a whole diagram, flipping it upside down, that will actually give you an inverse because when you reduce your dipoles, it will cancel down to the, the single. And so now we have a group, yeah? <laughs> All right. Um, um, before I say more about the group, let me mention a fact, which I think is going to appear on your exercises tomorrow, um, which is useful when you're trying to do these things, is every diagram is equivalent to a unique reduced one. And when I say reduced here, so I'll put reduced in parentheses because I'm gonna, not going to write down this definition, but it is what you think, right? It's reduced if there's no dipoles left. 
So there is a unique um, smallest diagram that you can get in each equivalence class that has no dipoles in it. Um, and there should be an exercise about this tomorrow. So a diagram like one, one of these and it's inverse? Yes, can I show one? Yes, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So our example there, right, so I had, um, so I'm gonna keep with that presentation. Um, so let's take that top diagram I had there, which was A, B, A. And then I did one substitution, which was to do this. And then I did another one, which was to do this. So the inverse, so if this is our delta, then delta inverse will be this diagram, but upside down. That means its top label should be, uh, okay, but this is not spherical, so what do I need to do to make it spherical? A, B, okay, uh, okay. Um, let me make it spherical. A, B, B, A, B, A, uh, okay. Okay, I'm just gonna work with this diagram. It's not spherical at the moment, but you can imagine if it was, then all you do <laughs> is I flip this diagram. Um, and yeah, and I'll do um, the diagram which has on its top BA, and then BA, and then the first substitution I do is I replace the A with A squared, and then I replace this with AB. So I'm taking this diagram and I'm just reversing the order I do. So I'm starting with the bottom label and then I'm just doing this cell first and then this cell second. Yeah, does this make sense to everyone? All right, but when the labels are, so these two you can see, this is an example where the diagrams you know, are not spherical but we can still multiply them and we can still see that they'll cancel out. Um, when we're talking about the diagram group itself, then we restrict just to diagrams where you have the same top and bottom label. Does this make sense to everyone? Does this answer the question? I'm not sure who asked it, but yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, right, okay, so yeah, so now the, we can say what the group is then. So the diagram group um, so the diagram group now depends on two things the presentation and the ba fixed base word. Um, so what this is, is this is the collection of equivalence classes. classes of diagrams with the operation of concatenation. Um, I can give an alternative definition using this fact, the fact that each one is equivalent to a unique reduced one, and, and then if we take that, we can equivalently say, equivalently, we can think about elements as being represented by the reduced diagrams, so DPU. And actually, when I say collection of equivalence classes, I should say of UU diagrams, right? And remember, I'm restricting the top and bottom word to be U. So equivalently, DPU, um, you can think about as the collection of reduced diagrams, reduced UU diagrams. with the operation of concatenation and then reduction. All right, so if I want to think about my elements as just being the reduced diagrams, then when I do the concatenation, I might introduce some dipoles and then I have to reduce the dipoles. Okay. It's not obvious immediately that the reduction is unique. Yes, it's not, it's not. It requires the notion of rewriting systems and confluence and things that maybe some of the you computer science people know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so, so uh, it uses New Newman's diamond lemma, so locally, local confluence. And, um, but again, yeah, you'll see in the exercises tomorrow. All right, so we have our definition. Let's look at a couple of examples of diagram groups.
right, so our first example, let's build the integers. Um, so what we can do is I can take the presentation uh, with three generators, A, B, and C, and I declare A equals B, B equals C, and C equals A. Um, and then I'll choose, I'll look at D, P, based at A. And so what this looks like then, you know, is I can do A. If I want to do anything non-trivial, the only thing I can replace A with is B. The only thing I can replace B with is C. And the only thing I can replace C with is A. So this is like our smallest non-trivial diagram. And then if I stack these, right, if I do products of these, we can see there's nev we're never going to introduce any dipoles that can get canceled out. So, you know, you can take this and then you iterate it, yeah? So then I do, yeah. So this is the minimal non-trivial diagram. Um, and this is our generator. Yeah, so exercise, do A squared, or do this diagram squared, and check that you don't introduce any dipoles here, that this indeed is a new diagram that you get. All right, um, example two. So you get Z. You get Z, yes, you get Z. Yep, yep, yep. All right, uh, example two, which I, as I said, was probably the main motivation behind uh, Guba and Sapir and Meekin and Kilobarta was Thompson's group F. Um, so uh, if you don't know F, what it is, um, the definition of F is it is the group of piecewise linear linear homeomorphisms of the unit interval with finitely many breakpoints with finitely many breakpoints um, at only at dyadic rationals. Uh, with slopes powers of two, with all slopes powers of two. All right, and the claim is that if I work with the presentation P that has a single generator and the relation that A equals A squared, the single generator, single relation, then we claim that DPA is Thompson's group F. Um, and again, we'll do this by example. So we'll start with the diagram, and then I'll show you how to build the uh, piecewise linear homeo of the unit interval with those properties. All right, so let's take, um, so all my edges in my diagram are labeled by the same letter A, so I'm just not going to label my edges, yeah. So these powers include, do you mean also uh, like uh, fractional powers? Yes, yes, also fractional powers, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, also negative powers, yeah, so like 1 over 2 to the n, yeah, as well. Um, yeah, so let's do an example. So let's look at the diagram here. We're going to start with the word A. Let's see. All 
OK, so here is a diagram. So everything here is labeled by A. So I have A, and then the bottom of the cell is A squared. And then I have A, and the bottom is A squared. And then I have an A squared, and the bottom is A, and an A squared, and the bottom is A. So all my edges here are labeled by A. So the way um, I build up this piecewise linear homeo right, is I'm going to do like a replacement here. So I'm going to start by making a tree pair. If you've seen Thompson group before, you've probably seen it also described in terms of tree pairs. But what you can do here is I'm going to make a tree like this. So in other words, I'm putting a vertex on each one of these edges, and then um, lines going through each cell here. And then I put my other tree here. All right, so now I have this pair of trees here, and I claim that this actually represents for us. So let me draw it over here. So this is the top tree, and on the bottom, I have this picture. And now what I can think about this tree as is it gives me a subdivision of the unit interval. So it's going to say I have 0, 1 half here, 3 fourths, uh, 1 half to 3 fourths. And here I have 3 fourths to 1. And similarly, I have a subdivision corresponding to this tree, right? So it says I should get, I'm not going to write it out here, but this gives me a quarter, a quarter and half of the unit interval. And now if I map this piece to this piece and the second piece to the second piece and the third to the third, then what I get here is my piecewise linear function. So one fourth, one half, three fourths, and one. Four. So what it says is I should map zero, one half to one quarter. So that means I'm going to have something that looks like this for the first portion. Then I map one half, three fourths to uh, one fourth, one half. So that means I have a constant slope here. And then this last piece is 1 half to 1. So then I end up with this like somewhat steep slope here. So I get this piecewise linear homeo. OK. How do we do that from a diagram you extract? You cut it into two halves. Yeah, well, so the way we can think about this, right? So this is something that needs checked, right? But if you think about it, right, because the top and the bottom are both just A, at some point you have to start subtracting A's, right? Um, and you have, to, you have to check that you can always do this in order where you have added A's and then subtracted. But that it has to be checked. You know, you check it, it. it can be just several, several alternations. So you can add A, subtract, yeah. and add A. So you don't have two trees exactly. Right, so, but, and that's what I'm saying. That has to, so you can turn it into two trees using the fact that diagrams are not diagrams, but equivalence classes of diagrams. So you can adjust your, the, your choice of equivalence class a bit. So for instance, if you start this one with, with itself, yes. then you're going to get a bunch of cancellations. Yes, you'll get a bunch of cancellations. You might have to do some expansions in the middle. You might have to insert some dipoles. But once you insert and reduce dipoles, um, then you can turn it into this. Yeah, indeed. Um, but this, and this is one of these cases where we're 100% taking advantage of the fact that diagrams, the elements in our group are equivalence classes and not just single diagrams. Because when you stack them, you need to do some reductions and things to turn them into this. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Um, all right, now that we have some examples, right, and probably in any class you've taken, you start with some examples, and then you start learning operations that let you build from the examples you have to get new examples. So the next section here is going to be on group theoretic closures, things that we can do and maintain the property of being a diagram group, which will let us build lots of new examples. So group <coughs> theoretic closures. So um, I'll, yeah, some of these we'll just name and not actually prove, um, just for time. Um, but the first thing I'm going to argue is that if I have two diagram groups, then the direct product is still going to be a diagram group. So, so um, let's say we have P1, it's sigma 1, R1, and we choose some base word U1, and I take P2 to be sigma 2, R2, and I choose some base word U2, then the claim is that I can take DP1 
you won this diagram group. I can take its direct product with dp2, u2, and that this will also be a diagram group. Okay. So the way we see this, um, so proof, when I take as my new presentation p, is I'm going to take the union of my two generators, generating sets. I take the union of my two relations. Um, and note, we're assuming just by default here that I don't have any letters showing up in common here in these two presentations. Um, then, if I look at dp, u1, u2, um, that this is exactly the direct product. So this is. All right, and this is the reason for this, right, is that if I have, so I'm just going to sketch the idea here. So if I have u1 and I have u2 here, then because, you know, my alphabets are disjoint here, I can do some substitutions here, and I can do some substitutions here, but they're disjoint from each other, right? There's no interaction between these because I'm assuming my generating set is disjoint, and so what I'm getting is on this side I have dp1, u1. Here I have dp2, U2, um, the elements commute, right, and there's no, um, and they're independent. Yeah, this is the idea. Okay. Um, and in fact, you can extend this um, with a little bit of work. You can also take, you can take, in fact, also infinite direct sums. Infinite direct sums of diagram groups. Our diagram groups. Obviously, this proof requires a little bit more work. It doesn't just generalize this one, right? Because we're only allowed finite words because we're talking about elements in a semi-group. So you have to do a little bit more work to build this up, but indeed you can do it. <coughs> but this is the idea behind many of these closures, right? Is we're gonna you start with your diagram group and then you build some new presentation that lets you do it. Yeah. Yes. And in, and in group theory, it tends to be true product, right? No, no, this is a direct product. Is this is a direct, because they commute. The two, oh, they, two commute. they commute, yeah. Commute. But free products of diagram groups are also diagram groups. That's another, like, <laughs> um, again, it requires some work. But yeah, here, here um, you know, so this is what I was mentioning before, that if you do a substitution on two disjoint words, you can choose which order to do it in, and it gives you the same diagram. And that's what's going on there, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So usually you take, yeah, yeah. They can be. Correct. You can take, well, no, you, so you can take, if you start with two finite presentations, this gives you a finite presentation because there you have the, the union of. For the infinite. Uh, for the infinite, indeed. But yeah, indeed, nothing here requires us to use a finite semi group presentation. Yeah. Um, yeah, and often you want an infinite one. Okay, so now we have z cross z. <laughs> this gives us, you know, an uh, arbitrary direct sums of the integers. Yeah. All right, so again, for time, we won't prove all of these, any, um, but some other things that diagram groups are closed under. Um, so some other ones. So if G is a diagram group, then I can take the wreath product of G with the integers. So G wreath Z is also a diagram group. So 
the proofs of all of these facts are similar, right? You start with the presentation for your original diagram group, you adjust it, maybe you add some extra generators, some extra relations, and then out of that you get this new diagram group. Um, so here, for instance, um, if G is DP, uh, DPW for P, you know, as usual, given my sigma R, then this wreath product H is going to be D, Q, A, uh, S, W, S, B, where this new presentation that you build Q has generating set sigma, union three additional letters, A, B, and S. And then you have all of your original relations, but then you add in A equals S, or A equals A, S, W, S, and B is equal to S, W, S, B. So, um, yeah, so it requires some proof, yes, but um, this will give you the diagram group for the wreath product. All right, so I want to jump now into square complexes. So square complexes. Um, so now we have a few examples. We have a few ways of building new examples. Let's get our second definition of diagram groups. All right, so the claim is we have another way of thinking about these diagram groups uh, as fundamental groups of certain complexes. So as usual, we fix our presentation. It's P. Um, then we define the square, square complex. Square complex. S of P. Um, to have, so it will have vertices. So, yeah, so I'm going to define the vertices, the edges, and the squares. So vertices are just the positive words. in my generating set. The edges here are going to correspond to a single step derivation. So the edges um, we'll label as uh, A, U equals V, B, um, where A, U, V, and V are words. And sigma. Um, and so this edge, the edge, it's going to connect A, U, B to A, V, B. So I'm labeling the edge this way so that I can say exactly what derivation I'm doing and where it is in the word, right? This is sort of important here. Okay. Um, and yeah, for this to make sense, um, I also need, so these are words with uh, u equals v, one of our relations, or v equals u, one of the relations in our list. Okay. Um, and now squares, okay, what squares are going to look like is they're going to correspond to doing derivations in disjoint locations. So. So a square So the corners of my square will be something like A, U, B, P, C will be this corner. And then if I do the substitution, say uh, U equals V here, then on this corner I'm going to have A, V, B, P, C. But then I can also do a substitution, say P equals Q, which gives me A, V, B, P, C, Q, C. Um, similarly, I can put P equals Q on this side, which gives me A, U, V, Q, C. And to get from here to here, I have also done the substitution U equals V. So this, these are what the squares look like. So it's exactly this thing that we've said you know, where I do a derivation on two disjoint subwords, right? These two operations commute with each other, and so we're going to think about that as giving us a solid filled-in square in our complex. All right, and these pieces define our square complex.
All right, so as I'm erasing here, um, one observation you might make is that this complex may not be connected, yeah? Um, so the connected components of this complex, since edges correspond to doing some derivation, connected components correspond to all the representatives you have of a fixed element in the semigroup. So if two vertices are connected, they're equal as elements in the semigroup. All right, so thus, if we want to talk about fundamental groups here, we actually do need to specify our base point. Um, but let's do an example first. Let's draw one of our square complexes, a component, anyway. So I'm going to take um, A, B, C, X, and Y, where I declare A equals B, B equals C, C equals A as before, but then I'm going to also have X equals Y. OK. So then um, if I look at, say, AX, then I can replace A with B and get BX. I can replace B with C and get CX, and I get this open triangle in the complex. But I can replace X with Y and get uh, AY, BY, and CY. Um, but now, because I have these commuting things, I have these filled in sides. So I have three, so what I have here is this complex, this connected component of my complex has six vertices and three squares in it. So I have a square on each side, but open top and bottom triangles. So this is the connected component. In fact, this is the entire connected component of AX. AX here. <coughs> so now we can define our second definition of diagram groups, or definition two. Um, the diagram group D P U is um, pi one of the squire complex of P based at the word U. So it's the fundamental group of this complex. <coughs> Had to be what? Yeah, so this is not a diagram anymore. This is, uh, this is going to be the square complex here. Yeah. So now we're going to build up this three-dimensional complex um, where paths in the complex correspond to derivations and loops correspond to beginning and ending at the same uh, label. Yeah. OK. Yes. 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 Ah, well, okay, because, because pi ones don't have to be abelian, right? These are just pi ones, yeah? yeah. Um, and so. My point was that they are secretly pi twos because, uh, because these uh, individual paths are actually. All right, well, yeah, uh, they, <laughs> they kind of look like pi twos, I agree with you. Um, but they're not quite, right? Because, because, I mean, the complex we have here has more than one vertex, yeah? So we're not really building this up the way you're imagining, right? We have this, it's a much bigger object. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, there's um, yeah, and in fact, like there, are no, no, it's not, it's not, no. But indeed, right? So what we, but all we have right now is just a pi one of some complex, right? Even if it analogously feels like a pi two, um, <laughs> it, it is not. And so, <laughs> um, right, okay. But the way we see that these things, you know, um, so we need to argue a little bit that these things are the same. Um, okay, so. Let's look at an example. So let me look in this complex that I have here, and let's look at you know, what's going on with these different paths. So for instance, I have this path here, 
um, which corresponds to doing, so uh, yeah, as I said, paths in this complex correspond to do doing derivations. And so this path, what it corresponds to is taking AX and then replacing A with B and replacing B with C, right? This is the two-step derivation corresponding to this path. But in this complex, you can see actually that there is something homotopic to it. Maybe you can check that if I do go down first and up, that this is homotopic. Um, and what this other diagram looks like is it corresponds to having AX. And then the first derivation I do is I replace X with Y. And then I do this derivation where I replace A with B and B with C. And now I go back up here, and so now I replace y with x. And when I replace y with x, can anyone see what the difference is between these two diagrams? What is it? A dipole, right? So what we've done here, all we've done here is introduce the dipole, yeah? This is a dipole, so in fact, these diagrams are equivalent. And so they're, in fact, yeah. Um, and so one checks. There's some, again, work to be done, but uh, per performing homotopy of paths in the Squire complex in SFP at most changes diagrams by adding and removing dipoles. So you have to check, right, that, you know, the different types of moves that you can do, um, yeah, the different types of moves that you can do, they either don't change the diagram at all when you're performing homotopies, or it might introduce or remove a dipole as you do these, like, the changes in the paths as you go. Are there questions? Yeah. Uh, what is pi one? What is pi one? Uh, it's the fundamental group. Uh, so, so if you don't know, that, yeah, so what all we're saying, um, is you fix a base point in your complex, and you look at loops that begin and end at the complex, and then you consider those up to homotopy, meaning I can kind of continuously move them through the complex. So, so in this example, right, um, so this is just a path and not a loop, but if I completed it to a loop here, and then similarly, completed it. So I claim that these two uh, cycles in my complex are homotopic, just, and what you do is you just slowly move this one up. So that's what we mean. So that turns out to be a group, and that's what's called the fundamental group of a complex. Um, and you, for, in fact, you can do this for arbitrary topological spaces. You look at loops up to homotopy, and those are the elements in the group. Does that answer your question? Yeah, kind, of. kind of, okay, okay. All right, all right. Um, good, okay. See, okay, I just have a few minutes left. Okay. Uh, okay, so in the last five minutes, um, let's talk about some generalizations that we can build here so that we can lead into next lecture. All right, so to generalize these diagram groups, um, we need to sort of take a dual approach to the diagrams. Okay, so uh, given a diagram, we can build a dual picture. And then replace any time we have diagrams with pictures um, to also form a group. So again, this is going to be kind of a definition by example. Um, so let's look at a diagram. 
say A, A, B, B. B, A, B, A, B, A. All right, so the way we're going to build up this dual picture is I'm going to replace each one of my cells here with a square, which we'll call a transistor. So I have a square, a transistor here, a transistor here. And then I'm going to have some edges going through each edge here. And I'm going to keep track of the labels of the edge that I'm passing through. So I'm going to extract this picture here, and I'm going to kind of straighten it out a little bit here. And so what I'm going to have is I have this square at the top, which has two wires coming out of it labeled A and B. And then below it, I'm going to have two new transistors. So I have one here with an edge connecting this labeled B. Ah, and I'm missing a couple of pieces here. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So I have B, and then I have another edge going all the way to the top labeled A, and then I have an edge here, A, and another one going all the way to the top with B, and then coming out of the bottom here, I should have B, A, B, A. And then I'm just going to put a square around this to indicate, like, I'm done. <laughs> So you can see that there's sort of a one-to-one -one correspondence between pictures like this and pictures like this. You can imagine what the dipole should look like. It's going to be two stacked transistors that have you know, these labels that let you cancel things out. Um, so yeah, so the word here, so we call the blocks these transistors. We call the other pieces the wires. Um, and when we take this dual approach of drawing these pictures with transistors and wires, this gives us something that's more easily generalizable to other settings um, and settings that are useful if we want to build other types of diagram groups, other types of groups which have similarly nice algorithmic properties. So the first way we can generalize this is to something called symmetric diagrams. All right, and so the point is here is now you're allowed, so if you notice in my picture, all my wires are completely vertically straight, but symmetric diagrams, uh, diagram groups, are going to allow you to have some crossing of your wires. So I can take the same picture. But now say, Maybe I have A comes down like this, and B comes here. And maybe I have some crossing here, B, A, B, A. Right. And then one does all the same things. You talk about what dipoles mean here, right? Um, and you have this notion of dipole, and you have this notion of concatenation whenever you have the same top and bottom label, and you have all these things that you need um, in order to get this to be a group. Right. So again, we're officially in the definition by example portion of the, the course in these last couple of minutes. But is this clear to everyone what this means without me like writing out a ton of extra words here? All right, and so similarly, you know, so what this lets you get, for instance, if you know Thompson groups, which I know a few people do, um, is this lets you get things like Thompson's group V, for instance, um, and other variations on things like this. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what about T? And what about T? Uh, yeah, so these are, so I, I was going to skip these because the picture is harder to draw, but it's called annular diagram groups. So you do the same thing, but you like embed it in an annulus, right? And this will give you Thompson's group T. It's like a little bit trickier. The pictures are a little harder to draw, but yeah, if you like 
So imagine that the wires have to come, can come back to the top, but you do like some twisting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, right, to draw something like that using like these pictures is very difficult, right? But you can certainly draw it with a picture like this, a T type thing. Um, and similarly, there has been a lot of uh, consideration recently of like braided groups. And so you can also introduce something called like braided diagram groups. So maybe you want to do all these algorithmic things to like braid groups and other, t you know, um, some other infinite groups. So you do the same thing. You have the same types of pictures, but now you're keeping track of the crossings and what goes in front and what goes in back. So you know you can do exactly the same thing. Build these diagrams, but now maybe you have a crossing and you want to say that this one crosses behind, you know. pictures like this, yeah. And now you have, you know, braid groups, and now you can do all these algorithmic things that you want to do uh, for diagram groups for braid groups and lots of other groups that can be described uh, using this. So for instance, yeah, you can get braid groups, you can get what's called braided Thompson groups, you can get uh, semi-direct products of Z with braid groups, and various other groups fall under these categories of these variations. Uh, and I'm actually over time, so this is a great place to end. Thanks. Yeah. I think they want to give you the microphone. Or I can repeat the question either way. If you apply this, you apply this to basically semi groups. If you apply this to groups in, more, in a more restrictive uh, setup mm -hmm. frame, yeah. do you obtain simplifications or things that overlap with uh, yeah. other existing? Yeah, things. so one of the, the generalizations I didn't mention is the move to monoids. So monoids is actually like the one that people, that uh, Guba and Zafir spend a lot of time developing out as well, where you allow the relation like u equals one, for yep. instance. And if you, and this is the reason why they first started drawing these pictures is because of the monoid picture. Because if you have a relation u equals one, say you have u equals one, then you might end up with one of these pictures where you have like this. Yep. And how do you concatenate these things? Like, where do you, you know, like, it's a lot less clear. Um, so you can do similar things, but things kind of are not so great when you have things like, uh, and like one of the things that goes wrong is this fact that we gave earlier, which is that every uh, diagram has a unique reduced diagram. That is false for these monoid pictures. And so then it's like, things are like much harder to work with because you don't, you can't always like reduce, it. like you might reduce in the wrong order and get like the wrong, you know. Um, it's a lot harder to see like when things are trivial and things like this if you start allowing like the group like properties of having an identity. Okay, right thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, is this theory related at all to the Van Kampen diagrams that like Olshansky used to prove yeah, Burnside's yeah, theorem? Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so there's exactly a notion of thinking about this as, um, yeah, you can definitely, there's a, a notion of thinking about diagrams as being, so, so diagrams that we have here, they're exactly Van Kampen diagrams for semi-groups um, because you're, you're filling in the disks that tell you how many relations it takes. So, so if you have a, two words that are equal in the semi-group, then there's a diagram that represents it. If you find the best one, right, then you count the number of cells and you're exactly doing like a Van Kampen argument there, right? You're like counting how many cells it requires to fill this uh, loop. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, these confluence things. Uh -huh. I remember that there is this kind of famous paper by some very famous person whose okay. name I unfortunately don't remember. Okay. It's, but it's like in annals or something and it's okay. like the basic theory of confluence. And I remember that there is a discussion of fundamental groups of uh, like uh, CW complexes or simplicial complexes that okay. you get out of rewriting words. And mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you were vaguely 
uh, referring to that when you said that there are these weird computer science things that you uh, need to I don't need know. To know. I Unfortunately, don't <laughs> I, I know that I could be a li little more specific. Yeah, yeah. This was many, many years maybe, ago. Maybe. I actually, when I looked at the <laughs> fundamental uh, groups, I was like, why, why would this guy be thinking about such things? But uh, now, yeah. I, now I'm like, maybe I should have read maybe that part fair. of the paper. Yeah, I have no idea. If you show <laughs> yeah. me the paper later, maybe I, 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 can, I can tell you. I can try, yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Any other question? Uh, when you oh, when you were talking about examples, you said it included many regs. Is that like the closure of Z under direct and free products, or is it um, more? Uh, more, okay. more. Um, so, for instance, Anthony is, has a couple of papers where he proves various diagram or various uh, right angled art groups. So for instance, um, I think they're called uh, interval right angle. So if you look at the interval zero or like one to n, and you look at a collection of sub intervals and you use those to define your vertex set, and then you connect two, I believe if they're disjoint, I wanna say is the relation, uh, then the right angled art group from that, for instance, is a diagram group um, and there are others. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Anthony's here. He can correct me if I gave that wrong. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Thomson groups also have nice actions on the counter space because uh, you can take yeah. the limit set of words essentially. Uh, this doesn't happen in general for diagram groups, I guess, but I don't know. Is there anything like that? N not quite, but you can build. Uh, so, so um, a lot of times when you're studying Thomson groups, you have these complexes that you build up that the group acts on. They're not counter sets, but they're. Um, but you have analogous pictures here, so you can talk about U blank diagrams, right? And then you have an action from above on those, and those give you complexes and things that I think you'll see more about tomorrow. Um, but it, but, but, it's but they're not analogous to things that show up in Thompson groups, but not, not counter sets necessarily. But still, it is not an action like by uh, asynchronous automata, like in Thompson groups, which essentially are prefix uh, replacements, uh, right? Yeah, but that's what you're kind of doing here too, right? You're just replacing the top of your diagram, right? Okay, Yeah. thank you. Yeah.